Beloved Church of God, beginning our service before the Lord, let us stand, please, and affirm with the proclamation of the faith of our heart, the promise that relates to the door of our hope. Let the resurrection of Christ reign in our bodies. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are grateful to your holy name for this once again presented privilege to be in this place that your hand has outlined for the worship of your holy name. And so allow your inheritance in the name of the blood of the covenant to be lifted to heights higher than us and to break all burden and sin that binds us. May in this service be cursed as before all the works of devil, illnesses, poverty, premature death, demonic dependencies, all forms of fears, depressions, destruction, selfishness, ignorance. All of this let it depart from the tents of your holy people. Stand now, Lord, on the place of your rest, you and the ark of your might. And may your saints be clothed in your salvation, and may they rejoice before your countenance. Give us more from your Spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Allow us to find your holy countenance. We thank you that this service is presented by Apostle Argadi into your divine hands, and we ask you to continue to lead it with your high and uplifted hand. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. May you be blessed. Please be seated. The letter from Matthew, chapter 5, verses 45 and 48. The words of Jesus Christ, which state that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his Son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Heavenly Father is perfect. The Sermon of Pastor is called called to perfection this promised commandment is the inheritance of the saints of all times and generations and it is addressed by Christ exclusively to his disciples and so those people that did not acknowledge over themselves the authority of the person sent by God but those who choose for themselves a person through a democratic vote have no relation whatsoever to the inheritance of this commandment nor will they likely ever have any kind of relation to it how are we able to acknowledge this power the power of the person sent by God is to fulfill that which he says Christ said to his disciples, If you love me, then you shall fill my commandments. We are called to collaborate in our heart only with the words of that person whom God has sent. Only in the mouth of this person, the word is the word that comes from the mouth of God. As it is written in John chapter 3, verse 4, For him whom God sent speaks the words of God. What does it mean to collaborate? To collaborate is to be vigilant, to be vigilant over the Word of God which we have hidden in our heart. And the Word of God in our heart is going to be only that Word which we have received from the person sent by God. This gives God the basis to be vigilant over this Word. Because God is vigilant only over the word that comes from his lips. The word of God is not abstract, and it is not placed in an abstract midst. It is placed in the heart of a person. It is through such a person that God magnifies his word over all of his names. When we see and magnify the Word of God in our body and in the boundaries of our body, when we are vigilant and when we magnify the Word which we hear, and when we can contain it and keep it in our heart, it is about this perfection that Jesus had talked about. That God is vigilant over the Word only in His temple. In this temple are our redeemed bodies. 
He is vigilant so that we can shine with our sun on the just and on the unjust and pour out our rains on the just and on the unjust the same way that he had done in his word. Because God is not tolerant. He loves the righteous and he despises those people who resist the truth. As a rule, we assimilate with our heart, writes Apostle Gadi, only that truth which is often repeated. In our listening, in our proclamations of the word that we hear, which we are called to ponder on day and night. And so again and again, repeating and affirming the truth in our heart, we have stopped to study the purpose of the righteousness of God in the heart of a person. Righteousness, accepted by us in the broken tablets of testimony and affirmed in the new tablets. Tablets are an image of the conscience of a person. From the contents of these tablets, what will be written there will depend on the state of the conscience of a person. Because only the righteousness of God that is engraved on the new tablets of testimony is called to give God the opportunity to give us the promise to be heirs of peace, not through the law, but through righteousness by faith, just as he had given it to Abraham and his seed. For the promise that he would be the heir of peace was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Romans chapter 4 verse 13. It is the inheritance of peace abiding in the heart of a person that is the treasury of our hope in God that contains in itself the bond of all of God's promises which are God's goal for righteousness. You see, the goal of righteousness is the peace of God, the promises of God. Righteousness has a goal. And the goal of righteousness is to take these promises. But as we know, along the way of God's righteousness, there is the righteous law of works. And we know that the law of works is an image of the strong city Jericho and its mighty walls. And remember the people of Israel had surrounded and walked around these walls, looked at these walls, and they wanted to destroy these walls. And humanly, it was impossible, for they walked around it, yet the righteousness of works kept standing. Just as then there was the law of Moses, even today this very same law of Moses is kept, but to it was also added a bunch of other works. You, If you don't wear a veil on your head, you won't be saved. If you don't do this or that, you won't be saved. You see how the fleshly mind has added to this law these are the false strongholds of salvations that stand as a fortress and in order for us to enter into the promised land it is necessary for us to destroy this false righteousness how with the teaching the teaching about true righteousness, which is by faith, and which is called and has its goal to clothe itself in a covenant of peace. And God has given to Abraham and to his seed the promise to be an heir of peace. So through righteousness by faith and not through the law of works. Thus it is not the law of works, but righteousness, which we have received by faith in Christ Jesus through the peace of God that is contained in the covenant of peace, that can and is called to keep our hearts and our thoughts in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so a question, what conditions do we need to fulfill so that in Christ Jesus, through our justification that has moved to the format of righteousness, again, justification changed to righteousness, how can we be clothed in the covenant of peace that is contained in the law of prophets, psalms, and in the law? 
and we already talked about the price the first price I will very quickly remind us of them the first condition or price for the right to be clothed in the peace of God that is called to guard our hearts and thoughts in Christ Jesus was to depart from evil and to do good depart from evil and do good seek peace and pursue it in Hebrew follow it pursue it you remember a very important component to depart from evil we must do when this evil is found in the limits or not in the limits of our if this evil is not in the boundaries of our responsibility we should not deal with it and step step on it but when this evil is in our responsibility in our limits we have the full right to step on this evil as it is written if you remember submit to god and resist devil and he will run away from you so you must clearly see this difference there is a specific sequence we must deal with evil and then we will have the opportunity to do good the second condition for the right to be clothed in the peace of God was comprised of the requirement to have a head turban out of linen I will remind you that a head turban out of linen is an attribute it's not just a hat or a head covering but it's an attribute that belongs to the new to the inner man who is invisible and this is none other than the acknowledgement over ourselves the delegated authority placed by God over us and our correct relationship to this authority and according to the presence of this head covering we can define that this specific person is able to inherit salvation if you also remember that a head covering or a kadar with a blue cord there was a golden plate a diadem that was attached to it with the engraving on it that says holy unto the Lord who does this diadem represent? These are people dedicated to God who have on their foreheads the seal of God that, which is called to serve as protection from the anger of God when judgment begins over the house of God. The image of this seal is pure thinking, the thoughts of the Father, which we tend to. So we accept the authority not just say I acknowledge pastor or I accept pastor but acceptance is comprised of the fact that we take the word that he preaches the word that is the word of God and we place it in our thoughts meaning we ponder over this and this is what it means to tend to the thoughts of our father And this testifies that a person has died to his former way of life, to the former way of life of the old man, and he has renewed his thinking with the spirit of his mind, which is the mind of Christ, meaning that he has rejected his own thinking, his own imagination of what righteousness looks like, and he has accepted the word, the authority of the person whom God has sent. You remember how the priest Aaron that was clothed he had a breastplate of judgment on him on his head a head covering and he stood between those that were dead and alive and I really liked this place which pastor had mentioned out of the Proverbs of Solomon. A person that is clothed in the dignity of a priest, when he collaborates with God, 
God can protect him and defend him. And so the third condition for the right to be clothed in the peace of God that is called to keep our thoughts in Christ Jesus is comprised of building and forming in ourselves a firm spirit. Isaiah 26, 3 You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. A bit above it says, Open the gates and the righteous nation will come who keeps the truth. Therefore God keeps a person in perfect peace under the condition that this righteous person himself keeps the truth in his heart. A person with a firm spirit in patience trusts in the word. In these words, the firmness of the spirit is one of the definitions and evidence of the fact that this person trusts in God. It is our trust in God that will be evidence of the fact that we have a firm spirit or that we rule over our spirit and that we are found in the authority of perfect peace which is impossible to violate even when against us all of the powers of the underworld unite because the firmness of the spirit or the ability to rule over our spirit completely depends on our trust in God in the fact that God is faithful to his word and is vigilant over his word what is the dignity of trust? It is a kind of virtue of the Spirit, which is as our state, as well as an answer of our reaction to our knowledge of who God is for us and what God has done for us. And this kind of reaction as an answer is expressed in the fact that we will have gratitude to God that is comprised of fulfilling a set of conditions, giving us the right to inherit that which God has done for us. Apostle John defining such relations between God and man, had formulated this with the following words. John 1.16 says, And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. Not grace upon grace, but grace for grace. Given that one of the meanings of the word grace is gratitude, then in the original, the meaning of this verse means, Pastor provides us, an extended version of or translation of this verse and of his the fullness of his capabilities all of us have reaped the gratitude of God for the gratitude of God that we have sown and pastor clearly shows and highlights that this is an exact sequence it's not God first who draws near to us and then we to him we draw near to him search for him and only then does he draw near to us as it is written draw near to him and he will draw near to you a person is a free being and god will not do something against the will of a person only when god sees that a person seeks him he will come out to meet him those who find me who seek for me will find me he says The gratitude of a person is a person's search. When a person begins to thank God for who he is for him and what he has done for man. And then God, as an answer to this gratitude, realizes all of those promises which a person has proclaimed. This is an answer of God's gratitude. Thus, in order to reap the gratitude of God in the subject of His grace that is yielded by His perfect peace, it is necessary to sow or to elevate thanksgiving to God for His specific works which He has done for us through the law of grace while we were still sinners. It is these specific works of God that are called to be our trust and to define and cultivate the capabilities tied to trust in God, we came to the conclusion that faith in hope produces trust. And consequently, or rather, therefore, we have noted numerously that we can trust only that in which we believe and that which we hope in. Because to trust in something means to lead on something to rely on something, to look upon something. 
to elevate or to build our building on something. And this something is supposed to be a certain foundation or a certain basis that is comprised of specific components, a part of which are such realities such as faith, hope, and love. And so the phrase trust in God means to lean on God and His Word, to rely on the Word of God, to thank God for His Word, to look upon the Word of God, to demonstrate our faith and hope in the Word of God, to elevate our building on the Word of God, to make the Word of God our shield and fortress, to make the Word of God our refuge and protection. Whereas the word hope means anticipation or waiting for that which God has promised. When we wait for something, this is always tied to patience, meaning we must have enough patience. If you remember who, what the enemy of impatience is, it is a person's haste. And so when it is necessary for our faith to do something out of that which God has promised, then it does this out of what is anticipated, or rather out of the treasury of hope which our trust is built on. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. Trust is hope in actions. Faith is to right now to live with according to the powers of the future age in which we show in our works and our actions our hope that is contained in our heart. It is when we have the foundation of hope upon which we can elevate some kind of building, then we will have the opportunity to trust in something. What is the foundation of hope for us? The foundation of hope is information, information that dwells in our heart about who God is for us in Christ Jesus and what God has done for us in Christ Jesus and through Christ Jesus. This is the information, again, that a person has placed in himself. And so the greater will be the level of our knowledge of hope, the greater will be the level of our trust in God. So the more we place into our heart faith, information, the more we will be capable to show trust in God. Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit, And so the root out of which flows the dignity expressed in trust in God grows out of the depths of the Godhead itself, which is the treasury of our hope. And so trust in God occurs from this hope in the word of God over which God is vigilant. And you remember that God is vigilant only over the word of a person whom he has sent. Trust in God is the building material out of which we are called to elevate our building on the foundation of our hope, which is Christ in the dignity of a chief cornerstone. And depending on the quality and level of our trust will be the quality and level of the building material out of which we build ourselves into a spiritual dwelling. And the way our building material will be out of which we build ourselves into a spiritual dwelling and holy place, it is such vessels we will be in the house of God, as it is written. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Everything will depend on the level of our knowledge from the level of our faith, who God is for us, what God has done for us. So from this will depend the level of our hope. The level of our hope will determine what kind of vessels we are going to be. Some for honor and some for dishonor. 
Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself uh, from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Second Timothy chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. If you remember, Pastor had uncovered for us the mystery that was contained in this place of Scripture. That the vessels that are for dishonor cannot be used for good works, although they are in the great house, but this is only the house that is here on the earth. In the church, in heaven, these vessels are not going to be suitable. There will only be vessels of gold and silver in heaven. All the vessels for dishonor, along with their contents, will remain here. And they, in time, will uh, disappear. Therefore, those people that are vessels of dishonor must grow, meaning they must leave their infancy, and they must transfer into the quality of vessels of gold and silver. And so, to build our trust in the, on the foundation of hope, we need to be vigilant over the Word of God that dwells in our heart, just as God is vigilant over it. Because in our heart is also hidden the Word over which God is vigilant. In a certain format, we have already looked at the quality of the building material that yields the character of trust in God, and the source out of which flows trust in God, which gives us the opportunity to gain the firmness of the Spirit. And so, what is the purpose, or what purpose does Scripture give trust in God that gives firmness to our spirit, in which God receives the basis to clothe us in His perfect peace? So, what is the purpose of trust? First, trust in God, giving firmness to our spirit, is called to give a person the right to call God his God. Psalms 30:15 But as for me I trust in you O Lord I say you are my God As we remember only those people that love correction and the instruction of the Father which God gives them through his delegated authority that have a correct relationship to him only such people have the right and opportunity to call God their God Love toward the instruction of the Lord is called to be tested by three things. I will quickly remind us of them. We've already talked about them in a greater context, but I'll remind us of these things. First, this is according to our uh, lack of participation to the thief and our ability to be vigilant at the gates so that the thief does not dig up our treasury, which is hallowed unto God. So the thief is an image of our old man. Why does a person become close with a thief? Because he looks upon this thief. And therefore he is going to be then uh, illuminated by this thief, or rather he will mirror this thief. And here we need to conduct a certain kind of sanctification where we reject this thief. And then the next step, it is written, uh, sanctification that is followed by dedication. We don't look at the thief. We are called to look upon something else. God says, look at the lily, at the process of the life of God that flows in the lily. And second, this is according to our lack of partaking to the uh, adulteress. I will remind us that we are referring to the spiritual adultery first and foremost, that this is the attempt to have a relationship with God while having a relationship with the old man. So when we look at the thief and when we try to somehow please him or have some kind of relationship with God in the meantime, and this is also a loving relationship toward this world, not just with the people of this world, but with this world and its values, with its desires, with, with its advertisement. And third, this is also our lack of partaking 
to the reproach against our neighbors. Only then will such a person have love in his heart toward correction and instruction of the Lord. And when he prays, he with a great right and boldness can say, Our Father, you are my God. Second, trust in God that gives firmness to our spirit is called to give a person the legal right to draw near to God in order to declare his works. Psalm 73, verse 28. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all your works. As you see, according to these words, only a person who trusts in God receives the right to draw near to Him. Trust in God, clothing us with the right to draw near to God, gives us the basis to declare God's works. And this kind of declaration is defined by the faith of the heart, which is based on trust in God. And this means to declare immortality on the deathbed or to call the inexistent in the dimension of time, the promise of God, as existent. And to look at the purpose of our trust, giving us the right to draw near to God in order to declare His works, we will need to remember the following. What purpose does Scripture place into the grace of God that gives us the right to draw near to God? Or what components of God's grace yield trust, giving us the right to draw near to the Lord? As well as what should we consider under all of the works of God? What is the need that is contained in the declaration of God's works, and how should we declare them in the presence of God? You see what kind of short place, but lots of questions, lots of questions and topics that Pastor has uh, identified for us. And so the first question, what signs of grace yield trust, giving us the right to draw near to the Lord? And so let's mention the initial phrase of the verse that we are studying. But it is good for me to draw near to God. This phrase, writes Apostle Arkadi, uncovers the role of a person and the role of God in the collaboration of God and man that is called to flow in the boundaries of the law of grace. In the word good is contained God's word. And in the word draw near, we see the role of a person. The word good includes the whole specter of the meaning that is contained in the meaning of the law of grace. And it talks about God's moral value and goodness. God's moral goodness, which is good in the absolute sense, which is good according to its results, which is good that is seen by others, good as a quality that is inside and outside, good that is highlighted by gentleness, beauty, harmonious fullness, proportionality, legality, right, truth, righteousness, and the fragrance that flourishes eternal life. This is the specter of the meaning of this word. And so when the author of the prayer song says, it is good for me to draw near to God, then the word good in relation to drawing near to God means healthy and faithfully important. And the word itself, or the phrase, draw near to God, identifies the role of a person in collaboration with God, and it talks about the requirements of the law of grace, on the basis of which a person on one hand is called to draw near to God in Christ Jesus, and on the other hand, in the requirements that are necessary for drawing near to God, which are the signs according to which we should judge and define the presence in our heart of a person that trusts in God. The phrase, to draw near to God, let's take a look at how Pastor has presented this for us. This is to enter into the presence of the Lord, 
to communicate with God, to call upon God, to draw near to God in the dignity of his intercessor as a priest, to enter into this sanctuary according to the rites of a priest, to draw near to God and to worship him in spirit and truth, to represent the interests of holiness and God's judgments, to thank God in praise and song, to quench the longing and thirst of God, to present ourselves to God as a living and holy sacrifice, to serve before the face of the Lord with sweet incense. According to this meaning, it follows that according to the words that yield the definition of drawing near to God, we see requirements necessary for trust in God, giving the grace of God the opportunity to reign in the heart of a person and thus to make his spirit firm and unshakable. Romans 5.21, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. From this place of scripture, it follows that grace does not reign in the heart of a person who has received justification, because justification, which we receive as a deposit, this is the work of redemption that belongs solely to God. All of us receive justification, as you remember, in the format of a seed. And only when we put this seed into the ground and water it, do we demonstrate obedience to the word. And it then begins to be rooted, affirmed, and strengthened. And it brings to bring fruits of righteousness. Only then do we receive grace in our heart. A person in whose heart the grace of God has reigned is the light and salt for this world. For in these skies is the sun, the moon, and the stars. This person begins to rule and to uh, govern over himself. Only a person of the fourth day understands what holiness is and what it separates and how it governs. And God created two great lights, one greater one for ruling over the day and another one for ruling over the night and the stars. And God had placed them in the firmament of heaven in order to shine on the earth and to rule the night and the day and to separate light from darkness. First, second, third day could not do this. They were called days, but the light that was there could not rule over a person. To rule and to govern can only be done by the light of the fourth day. The light which comes from those people or those lights which God has placed. And so a person of the first, second, or third day was an image of God's infants, carnal, that do not understand that of what they do not understand that which comes from the spirit and consider it as foolishness. They resist it and so forth. And so just as sin reigned in death, sin reigns in death in the body of a person until he leaves infancy. Until he stops relying to his household, to his nation, and to his corrupt desires. Before this, or until this, sin will have authority over such a person. The same way that grace reigns through righteousness when we, having been justified, then our justification moves into the format of the quality of righteousness. And only then, through righteousness and faith, through information that Christ can be reigned to eternal life, or rather justification is reigned. To reign is to rule, to rule in our renewed thinking, which begins to rule over our lips. If you remember this place of scripture, we had studied it by memory, which pastor had uncovered in a broadened translation, my justification is founded on the teaching of Christ and the power of this teaching 
dwells in all spheres of my life. Glory, the glory of the teaching that dwells in me is immortal, and I rule over the firmness of my spirit, meaning justification that transfers into the quality of righteousness. This talks about the strength of our spirit. The second question, what should we consider under the works of God, under all of God's works? What is the need that is contained behind declaring all of the works of God? And how shall we declare of them in the presence of God? We should always remember that all of God's works are the immeasurable mercies of God that yield for us the great work of His redemption that is contained beyond the limits of understanding of it through our mind. All of God's works are the revelation of God's mercy, which stands beyond the ability to acknowledge them with the human mind. The work of redemption that contains in itself all of God's works is comprised of who God is for us and what God has done for us. As it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear has heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Pastor highlights and says, attention to us. God has opened this through his spirit. To whom, a question is asked, did God open this? whose eye has seen, whose ear has heard, and in whose heart this was received. Apostle Paul says, us, he is referring to himself and his companions, those people whom God has delegated. Uh, to us, God has opened this through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. A person himself is the carrier of the Spirit. For what reason? To know that which no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and what has not entered into the heart. The, when a person that is sent by God, the delegated authority of God, the apostle, when he can compare spiritual things with spiritual, when he uncovers the word for us, then the carnal person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But a person has not yet grown. In the heaven of his heart there is not yet a sun, moon, and stars. He cannot distinguish the signs to separate the day from the night. Grace has not yet reigned in him. He cannot understand. But it is written that the spiritual man in whom grace has reigned judged of all things, but about him no one can judge. And Pastor explains for us that to judge a spiritual person can be judged, and the spiritual is judged always and everywhere. But here we mean that no one can give a correct appraisal to a spiritual man. For who has known the mind of the Lord so that he can be judged? But we have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9-16 through 16. Only the one who has the mind of Christ can give the correct appraisal. To summarize this component in the purpose of trust that is called to make us uh, firm in spirit to give God the basis to clothe us in the perfection of His peace, we came to the conclusion, says Apostle Arkadi, that the purpose of our trust is comprised of fulfilling certain requirements, giving us the right to realize all of that which God has done for us in the great work of His redemption. And these requirements 
are comprised of fulfilling certain conditions that highlight the order and sequence of total sanctification, which pursues the goal of the order and sequence of total dedication to God, giving us the legal right to then be able to draw near to God. So if we say this or summarize it, in sanctification there is an order. There is an order that follows a certain goal, and this goal is dedication, in which there is also an order about how we can dedicate ourselves to God. In order to draw near to God, we need total dedication, which could pursue the goal, sanctification for total dedication. And Pastor says this is not some kind of encounter, which, as we know, uh, is a lie which is practiced by many churches where people think that over a span of three days they can be sanctified. Sanctified and dedication, this is a process, the process of our whole entire life. Total sanctification is a separation from something and for us to be then attached to something, to die to something, to then live for something. We die to our nation, the house of our Father, and to our corrupt desires that are clothed in religious garments. For what reason? So that we can live by faith. Third, trust in God, giving firmness to our spirit is called to be a guarantee of the fact that God will hear us when we pray. Psalms 38, 15 For in you, O Lord, I trust. You will hear, O Lord, my God. According to these words, it follows that people that do not have a guarantee that is yielded by trust in God cannot be heard by God when they pray. David says in his prayer, You will hear me, O Lord, because I have trust in you, because I trust in you. God gives a guarantee in his word that he will hear our prayer if we trust in him. When we pray, we ought to be calm and know that God will hear us. We oftentimes, very often, want God to comfort our feelings, but God has given us the authority of his word and we demonstrate this authority on our earth. When we ourselves calm our emotions, this is our role to calm our emotions. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, wrote, uh, prayed Christ. God's promises now are not information, but this is faith from hearing the word of God. Faith is not what I feel, but it is that which comes from the supernatural sphere, from the heart of a person, through the preached word of the messenger of God. God says if we trust in him, then when we pray, he will hear us. When and how he will answer us, this is the decision and the prerogative of God. We must simply await to clearly engrave on the tablets of our heart, in our conscience, what we anticipate, so that God who reads can see what he should fulfill for us, because God will fulfill for us that which is engraved on the tablets of our heart. Because the lack of trust in God is the lack of a guarantee for the right to enter into God's presence and the dignity of a warrior of prayer that represents the interests of the will of God. So warrior prayer does not enter with his own interests and his own needs. He clothes these needs into the will of God, meaning he studies, he accepts, he is found in them. He is found in such a will, and only then can he represent it as the will of God. It is trust in God that is before God, evidence and expression of total dedication to God, which was preceded by total sanctification, which was, or sorry, total 
total dedication that was preceded by total sanctification, which involved separation from our nation, the house of our forefathers, and our corrupt desires. And this is so that our prayer can be a sweet incense before God and could gain grace before the eyes of God. The presence of trust in God that gives God the basis to answer our prayers with his perfect peace is called to be tested by our love. The love of a person toward righteousness and hatred towards lawlessness with all of the subsequent results that follow. We should never forget that righteousness and lawlessness are two programs opposing one another. They are programs of life and death that come from two totally different sources, which on their own, without a programmable device, cannot reveal themselves or function as programs. As far as we know, writes Pastor, this kind of programmable device can only be sovereign beings in the face of people and angels. And so to love righteousness and to hate lawlessness is possible only in sovereign personified programmable carriers, which are people and angels. So this program is not separated from its carriers. So there is he who carries this program and towards him is either God's righteousness or lawlessness attributed. As it is written, you love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. All your garments are scented with mir and aloes and cassia. With mir and aloes and cassia. Out of the ivory palaces by which you have by which they have made you glad. So, in other words, somebody that loves righteousness and hates lawlessness, God anoints with oil of gladness and looks at his garments as mir and alos. Righteousness, these are our garments. And when a person reveals God's righteousness, how does he reveal it? By a relationship toward hatred and a relationship toward righteousness. We either hate lawlessness uh, we have to hate lawlessness and love righteousness. These garments then are pleased by God. Uh, he views this as an incense. It is a sweet incense to God, a sweet fragrance. The garments of such righteousness bring joy, uh, bring joy to God. Just like trust in God brings joy to Him. Furthermore, that place of scripture Kings' daughters are among your honorable women. At your right hand stands the queen in gold from Ophir. Listen, O daughter, consider and incline your ear. Forget your own people also and your father's house. So the king will greatly desire your beauty, because he is your lord. Worship him. And the daughter of Tyr will come with a gift. The rich among the people will seek your favor. The royal daughter is all glorious within the palace. Her clothing is woven with gold. She shall be brought to the king in robes of many colors. The virgins, her companions who follow her, shall be brought to you. With gladness and rejoicing they shall be brought. They shall enter the king's palace. Psalms 45, verses 7 through 15. This place of scripture, says Pastor, contains in itself the calling of such a person who has trust, as, as well as the condition through which a person is endowed with properties that yield the firmness of his spirit and the right to worship God in spirit and truth. Here are four conditions that are shown to us, or four verbs. I think you remember them, we've heard them. Listen look, incline, and forget. The spirit of a person will never be firm until a person's nationality fills his eyes when his household, when his relatives, according to the flesh, will declare uh, that he be with him while they are um, committing idolatry. 
because we can say, I reject the vain life of my forefathers passed on to me, but not live as one that has rejected this. To reject our household is to say to ourselves, if you remember, as the Levites has said, I did not look upon my father and did not acknowledge my sons. They are Levites who keep the words of the Lord. So we must make the decision in benefit of the word of God. Now our household becomes our brothers and sisters in Christ. Thus, we demonstrate our trust and pay the coinciding price. Fourth, trust in God giving firmness to our spirit is called to produce in the heart of a person joy, and it is called to give God the basis to shield a person who trusts in God. Psalms chapter 5, verses 11 through 12. Let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor you will surround him as with a shield. From these words it follows that God truly shields only those who trust in him. And that true trust in God, giving firmness to our spirit and yielding in our good heart the atmosphere of the perfect peace of God, first will produce joy and gladness in the good heart of a person. Secondly, God will shield such people. And third, those that trust in God will boast of God because they will love the name of God. Turning to the first sign as the result that comes from trust in God, which is yielded by the fruit of joy and gladness in the heart, it follows that the fruit of righteousness is absolute confidence that God is going to shield us or that he is going to serve as a shield for us from all kinds of fear. There is a kind of phrase that says, fear has big eyes. However, the fruit of joy that comes from trust in God has greater and stronger eyes than fear. Fear that is due to the result of a lack of trust in God. What is the lack of trust in God? This is the lack in the heart of truth about who God is for us and what God has done for us. You see, rooted and affirmed, meaning the seed that has rooted and has brought fruit. Everything will depend on what we look upon, what we trust in, and therefore the result will be different. When we look at the works of the old man and all that is earthly, we will have human fear that is generated. But when we have trust and we look not at ourselves, but when we look at who God is for us, who are we in Christ Jesus, and what God has done for us in Christ Jesus, and through Christ Jesus, then these are strong eyes. They are so great and mighty that they don't see any kind of human or earthly fear. We are called to look from not the position of what we can do, but from the position of what God can do. We are placed in Christ, and we have the same kind of power and trust that casts out the fear of death. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. This is where trust is taken. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 
They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We, John says, are of God. He who knows God hears us. So he hears the person whom God has sent. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So the result will be different. There will be a different kind of fear or a different kind of nature of fear that will be revealed among or in a person. And so upon the lack of trust in God, that God is faithful to his word and that he is vigilant over his word, a person will therefore believe all kinds of spirit of seduction and all kinds of prophecies that come from false prophets that are going to try to sow the fear of man. And furthermore, people that are found under God's shield, which is yielded as trust in God, are people that love the name of the Lord, which is their trust. And they are those that boast of God. Thus, trust in God, giving firmness to our spirit, is called to be verified by the result of joy and gladness and the good heart of a person, which is the atmosphere of the perfect peace of God in their hearts. So they will have peace in their hearts. Fifth. Trust in God, giving firmness to our spirit, is called to express itself in honoring God and simultaneous service, serving as a shield from His anger. Psalms chapter 2, verse 12. Honor the Son, lest He be angry, and you perish in the way when His wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in Him. We are referring to those people who have trust. Only they will not perish. Trusting in the Lord, in this manner we honor God. From these prophetic words it follows that the lack of trust in God is the lack of honor toward God, from which we can conclude that those saints who call themselves saved but cannot present evidence of their trust in God they are the vessels of his anger, whereas saints who represent evidence of trust in God, on the contrary, are the vessels of mercy. And one of the evidences that a person trusts in God will be the sign that is expressed in honoring the Son of God. The word to honor means, Pastor uncovers to us, means, to be guided by His Word, by the Word of the Son of God, to touch His Word, to revere and tremble before His Word, to hope and trust in His Word, to lean on His Word, to consider His Word our riches, to look upon His Word, to rejoice in His Word, to bow down before His Word, to dwell in His Word, and to not leave the limits of His Word. Sixth, trust in God giving firmness to our spirit is called to deliver us from the fear of our flesh as well as the fear of all flesh. In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? Psalms 56 verse 4. From out of these words that we have read it follows that a person that trusts in God does not fear flesh and all of that which comes from the flesh. Given that through his trust in God, such a person is transferred from the atmosphere of fear into the depths of God, which for him is the atmosphere of perfect peace in which he can praise the word of God. This is our responsibility. We must transfer ourselves through proclamation. And we already know that the essence of praise is comprised of thanksgiving to God in the fact of who God is for God, for us and what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. When we begin to thank God who He is for us and what He has done for us in Christ Jesus, we in this manner begin to call the inexistent as existent. And thus, 
we fulfill the requirement that gives God the basis to fulfill for us the promise of redemption, which He has done for us in Christ Jesus. Whereas fear that comes from flesh on one hand is comprised of the fact that a person looking upon his flesh is deprived of the garments of God's glory, and he realizes his nakedness before God and tries to clothe his flesh in the works of his personal virtue. You see what human fear pushes us to. It tries to somehow fix us to clothe oneself in these leaves, just like Adam and Eve had worn before. But as soon as God begins to reach out to his blemished conscience, he in fear begins to hide from God in the trees of the garden, which are an image of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And on the other hand, fear that comes from flesh expresses itself in corrupt desires or any other kinds of dangers. So all of this happens in us. Each of us perhaps uh, understands how this can happen. And if a person is not familiar with the truth about the cross of Christ, that is called to deliver a person from the fear of flesh by overthrowing it from power, then it means that this person does not have trust in the Word of God, and consequently, he does not have any kind of guarantee to fulfill his salvation, because he is not familiar with the truth about the cross of Christ. How sorrowful and unfortunate this is. So I personally only hear from our pastor for the first time had heard the fullness and the beauty of this truth, which he uncovered, uncovered for a span of all these years. And knowing this information, a fear departed from me, fear before the cross of Christ. I see that this is a weapon, that this is a privilege. This is the weapon that is given to us. It is the grace of Christ, which we are able to uncover as a key in ourselves, in our hearts. Access to grace. So access to the greatness of God. Seventh, trust in God, giving firmness to our spirit, is called to serve for us as absolute independence from the fear of all men. In God I have put my trust, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Psalms 56, 11. From this testimony it follows that a person that trusts in God does not fear men, given that fear before men testifies of the lack of trust in God. In other words, we trust in that which we fear, who we boast of, as well as before whom we walk, or rather from the appraisal and opinion of those who we depend on. Pastor says, observe very carefully from what appraisal we depend on. From the appraisal of people, when people appraise us, or from the appraisal which God gives to us. 1 Corinthians 4.3 But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I did not even judge myself. This is spoken by Apostle Paul to Corinthians. Pastor focuses our attention to the position of a person that trusts in God. He does not judge himself, meaning I do not give an appraisal myself, but I allow for God to judge so that he could appraise me and all of my actions and all of my service. This is the position that we ought to take up. Such a person does not talk about what works God has done through him uh, or about his carnal talents. It is good for a person to live and to not depend on somebody else's opinion. And he should think of himself only as God thinks because such a person therefore demonstrates that he walks before God. 
I, for some time, a long time, I was at an appointment with Pastor, and he then said to me many years ago, he says, Igor, if you learn to not depend on the opinion of people, you will gain the ability to overcome all of hell. I then uh, honestly did not understand this phrase. It seems only superficial, it seems understandable, right? But there was a very deep meaning behind it. And not understanding, though I knew who said this word to me, that this was spoken to me by a person of God, that the word that he says is the word of God. And for many years, I, it required and it took me many years to begin to understand. So when the sun, moon, and stars had entered into the heaven of my spirit, God began to uncover the meaning of this phrase. I just want to remind us that those truths which we don't understand, we simply must, in humility, place them in our hearts, ponder over them. And God, seeing such humility, seeing the fact that we uh, honor the person whom he has sent, then God will uncover for us these truths in time. This is his right and this is his prerogative. Because whenever I hear in my address incorrect words or opinions, I begin to consider and think in myself, Lord, how good is this that only people are saying this and not you? This is their appraisal, not your own. Because a person is a free being. He has the right to pass along whatever he wants to pass along. He himself chooses what kind of vessel he shall be and what to keep in his vessel. I thank God that I have this um, that I can be found in him, that I am freed from this slander and that I can continue to rejoice, not paying attention to this slander, or gossip, and opinion of people. There's a phrase, just like the water bounces off the goose. When a goose, he dives into the water, he gets out of it, the water, he's left waterproof. Why? Because his wings are covered in silver. Again, as an image, this is an image from Scripture. I like how Pastor Daniel had testified how he uh, behaves toward this, and I will say it very shortly. Then when bad, bad people say something negatively about me, they don't even know that I am worse off when they speak gossip. They don't even know that uh, when they boast of me, they boast of the new man. This is not my dignity. This is the dignity of Christ in whom I am clothed. And the last one, trust in God giving firmness to our spirit is called to uncover in our heart the potential of God's goodnesses. How many are your goodnesses which you give to those who trust in you? In these words, the fear of the Lord is defined by trust in God, which gives God the basis to reveal a multitude of His goodnesses which He has kept and prepared in the covenant of His peace for those who trust in Him. If we fear God, this means that we can trust in Him. And in these intentions of God, Pastor focuses our attention to the fact that the multitude of God's goodnesses God intends to give us 
before the face of all men under the condition that we before the face of all men demonstrate trust in God in his fear. This is talking about those promises that are going to be given to us here on the earth, not an eternity when we transfer. Pastor says, comforting us, and he uncovers that in the end days, before the church is raptured, he will clothe her into the new man, into the resurrection of Christ, before all the face of all men. Then they will see that which was not spoken to them, and they will find out that which they had not heard about before. So God will reveal and demonstrate his righteousness. When people will see those that are freed from weaknesses, illnesses, all that is earthly, such people will no longer be bound by this world. These are those that are going to be prepared in order to be raptured alive. The Lord has made us such people in Christ Jesus. Amen, saints. We will pray. Our time has come to an end. We will pray and thank God for that word that we were able to remember and affirm today. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you again and again that you have given us the opportunity to hear and affirm your great word, which was presented to us by our pastor, by the person whom you have sent to declare your word to the church, to declare your joy, to declare your trust. Trust which gives firmness to our spirit. We thank you that when we are humbled, when we accept your correction and instruction, we have the right to call you our God. You have taught us to not look at the thief, our old man, to protect our heart from every kinds of thought of rebellion, and to take that life which flows in the lily. We thank you, our Father in heaven, for you have taught us to not converse with adulterous those that call themselves believers but live according to the principles of this world. You have renewed our thinking and our mouth has become capable of proclaiming your word in relation with one another. We thank you for your goodness, for the gratitude which you have demonstrated to us and that we can draw near to you on the laws and requirements of your grace. Thank you, Lord, for the power to draw near to you in order to declare of your works, to declare the faith of the heart that is founded on trust in you, to declare of immortality on the deathbed, and to call the inexistent as existent. You have promised to hear our prayer if we have trust in our heart. When we in patience wait for the answer, the time which you have placed in your authority, for in you, Lord, do I trust. You will hear, Lord God. We thank you, our Father, that you produce joy and gladness in our good hearts, that you shield us and that we can boast of you because we love you and we demonstrate obedience to the preached word, the preached word of the person whom you have sent. 
and let all those who trust in you rejoice, will forever rejoice, and you will shield to them. And they will boast of you, those who love your name. We thank you that having trust, we have protection from your anger for the opportunity to honor your Son, Jesus Christ, to be guided by your word, to revere and to tremble, to hope and to trust, to trust in your word and lean on it. Through the knowledge of the truth about the cross of Christ, you deliver us from the fear of all flesh and from dependency on fear before people. In God, I trust. I shall not what I shall not fear for what shall flesh do to me. We thank you, our Heavenly Father, for Christ, that you have justified us, regardless of the works of the law, according to the gift of your redemptive grace, through faith which you have given to us, through the preached word. We rejoice in your word as those that have received a great reward. We thank you for justification that is founded on the teaching of Christ and that the power of this teaching abides in all spheres of our life. Praise, the praise of the teaching that dwells in us is immortal for we have the, for we rule over the fortress of our spirit. We thank you that you have allowed us to have unblemished joy in our hearts and that we are able to proclaim the faith of our heart. For you are our King. You have taught us through our good proclamations to catch ourselves in your snares of love. You have ensnared, your, ensnared yourself and are caught by the word of your lips as it is written. For the King trusts in the Lord and under the authority of the Almighty, we will not stumble. Allow us to keep and take hold of these precious promises until the day of your coming. You, Lord, want to give us our healing as our fruit, as our property, which no one can take away from us. We thank you for the fruit which grows in us in patience. And now, do not leave your trust, which is preceded by a great reward. For we know that we need patience to fulfill the will of God, to receive what has been promised. For it will be a little time, and the Lord will come and will not tarry. We pray, Lord, for our dear Apostle Arkadi. We anticipate him in patience when you will again give your great mercy to the church so that we can see and rejoice in the word which you have prepared for us. We thank you for this hour of fellowship and thank you for your divine order in which you teach us. We thank you for all of your servants who zealously labor for all the prayer warriors, leaders, ushers, cameramen, for all saints. We thank you and we worship before you our Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And in conclusion of our service, we will proclaim our unchanging manifestation. Now to him who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory and unblemished joy. To God, our Savior, who alone is wise, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, 
be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.